Well, we thought today we'd take up a second offering if we get out of the usher. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, with, uh, we're, we're just going to continue on this uh, little theme of kingdom. I call this my snow day message. Because um, what happens when you prepare sermons is you have too much stuff. And you're like, oh, I really would like to preach on this, but I've got to put it over here. And so I thought, snow day, I can preach on this other stuff. So anyhow, growing into the kingdom of God. If you think about the kingdom of God, if you're brought into the kingdom of God, there is this theme that is found throughout the Bible. And I think it's good for us to know, I call it the meta-narrative. What is the overarching story from Genesis to Exodus? Not just Genesis to Exodus. Genesis to Revelation. What is the meta story? What is that whole story about this whole book? And why is a book that's several thousand years old still relevant today? You know, it's like you ask yourself, so this Bible has been around 2,000 years. It can't possibly understand what I'm going through today. Well, you know, the guy who discovered gravity, he discovered a few thousand years ago too, still affects me today. Watch this. Still works. Relationships between men and women have not changed in the last 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, old earth, new earth, doesn't matter. Relationships don't change. There's struggle. Struggle in relationships. I mean, Dawn Starr's got little baby Raven coming soon. There is struggle in birth, you know? As, as all these things come in relationships, there's struggle. And this, this Bible helps us to understand reconciliation. Not just with God, but with people around us. And so this is a very practical Bible. Well, this one's been used a lot. Very practical, the Word of God is. So part of the theme is that God wants to be with us. In the Garden of Eden, He wanted to be with us. He walked with us. He didn't want separation. You think of the tabernacle, which is they were in the desert, and they, and they took like skins, and they did all these things, and they made this like, giant tent, and how the tent was in the middle of the people. It was the same place the Ten Commandments were kept. You know, Ten Commandments were actually not five on one stone and five on the other. When you made an agreement in the Old Testament, you'd have two sets of rules, one for each person that was involved in the covenant, and then you, each person would put it in the most special place. And so for God, he put it in the heart of his people, in the middle of his people, surrounded by his people, because his most precious place he wanted to be was with his people. And then the people put their tablet in the Ark of the Covenant, in God's presence, in his place of worship. And so, most important place, God wants to be in relationship with us. Same thing with the temple, a place where people could go. You know, there's a Samaritan woman once asked Jesus, you know, who's the right place to worship, your temple or our temple? And Jesus is like, someday, it's not going to matter where you worship, because you worship in spirit and truth. Don't worry about the building. Your, he didn't say this at the time. He said it later. Your bodies will be the temple of the Holy Spirit. You will have communion with God because that's God's major plan. In fact, that's why Jesus came. He came to get things out of the way between humanity and God. He taught us. He was going to teach us how to live with one another as well. I mean, the way he treated women was so beyond its time, so before its time. He loved everyone. And it was such an incredible example to all of us to be like him, to be in good relationship. And it doesn't just stop there. In the book of Acts, when it comes into the time of the Holy Spirit being released, it was God saying, you know, people say you can't put God in a box, and yet he was in the Ark of the Covenant for a long time. But you can't keep a good man down. You can't keep him there. He wanted to be with God. Us. This is the theme. He wants us to be in his kingdom. You know, listen to John 14. He talks about how, he, how he's gone to heaven. He's going to be going to heaven. And he says, I'm preparing a place so that you can be where I am and I can be where you are and we can be together. This is going to be awesome. It's like preparing the best party in the whole world and you want your best friends there. He wants to be in relationship with you and he wants it to be healthy and life-giving. And you'll find if you've grown up in the church, and I think most of you have, you grow up in the church and religion can be stifling. It can be the opposite of life. And we need to get past those things, just like Jesus did, get past the temple, get past the religious things, and come into the real kingdom of God. Come into the real kingdom of God. And that's why I'm preaching this whole series on the kingdom of God, because 
Jesus said there's a kingdom of God here right now that's available to us. So what's this kingdom look like? Well, I think when we, when we are brought into a kingdom, it's almost like a dynasty. We're brought into an, an, an airship. And so we don't, I don't mean like a, an airship that flies. I mean like H-E-I-R. We, we come into an inheritance. And in Jewish culture, you didn't just, you know, your father didn't just kick the bucket and you gained the farm. If you did not know how to use the equipment on the farm, you were likely to be cut out of the will. So you had to learn piece by piece as you got older how to manage, how to use each part. And so it's, it's the same as like when Israel's becoming a nation. They weren't allowed to just like conquer everything. They had to conquer it piece by piece by piece. And that's the way it is in our own lives too. It's like the kingdom of God is invading our heart. And piece by piece by piece by piece, more and more gets surrendered. And it's a wonderful, messy process. But sometimes we don't feel safe talking to other Christians about our mess. <laughs> but we should feel safe. Should. But are we? Uh, you're safe with me. Are you safe with each other? I don't know. Uh, you can only find that out by testing, by testing the waters with people. And it's not always advisable to share every mess with every person because sometimes it's, it's stuff that you've got to work with on your own or, or with a pastor or with a counselor. So what happens? You come into this kingdom and, and just like Raven, I'm going to pick on Raven today. Sorry, buddy. Just like Raven, he has no choice. When he's brought into the kingdom of this earth, when he comes alive in a, in a, in a whole new realm, he's going to leave the realm of mommy's belly, and he's going to come into this realm of living. You know what happens to him? Besides, you know, number one and number two, he starts to grow. He has no choice choice. It's just natural. He just starts to grow. Joey's a big man. There's someday I'm probably going to look up to Raven. It's like, it's like I told uh, this little fellow here. Yeah, I told him. I told you that I was going to look up to you someday because your dad, Brad, he's tall. Someday I'm going to look up to these kids because I heard too that the older you get, you start to shrink too. I don't know if that's true. It's kind of making me nervous. Not true? Hallelujah. That's good. So I can still remember, maybe, maybe many of you guys can relate, when, when you have to bring a baby home for the first time, that, my friends, is scary. <laughs> You're like, I mean, the nurse isn't coming home with us? Uh, <laughs> thankfully, I married a nurse, so I brought the nurse home with me. <laughs> thinking ahead, folks, thinking ahead. <laughs> it's scary. It's like this person's life totally depends on you. They can't even clean themselves. And so when you first come into the kingdom of God, you're going to grow, but it's going to be messy, and it's okay. I don't think I've ever met a parent that's ever gotten mad because they had to change a diaper, unless I've seen people gag, though. That's, been, <laughs> that's kind of funny. <laughs> so when we come into this kingdom, God has asked us to, to show his wisdom to the world. It's part of the natural growth that happens in us. It's to show his wisdom to the world, to show him not religion. Religion will just kill you. But to show the real kingdom of God. So I like to say, if you like what you see in me, if you like the joy you see in me, it's not that I've never gone through hard time, it's because I've experienced the real kingdom of God. And it's not something I learned in church. It's something I learned from the people in church. It's something I experienced. I looked at some people, I'm like, I like what I see in that person. Not so much over there, but this guy or this girl. And, and so, you know, you become like the people you hang out with. So you gravitate towards people that you can tell are full of God. You gravitate to people who are full of life. Because from what I've experienced in God, you can, you can get into religious practices and totally miss Jesus Christ. Titus is a great book if you're struggling with that. It's God, he go, Paul's, one of his last books he wrote was to Titus, and he says, don't get caught up in Jewish myths, right? Religious myths, man-made rules, they exist. I wasn't allowed to go to movies on Sundays growing up. What was with that? I got in trouble for going to see the Care Bears. <laughs> don't tell anyone I saw the Care Bear movie. <laughs> but I did, I went to the theater, and it was, a, it was on a Sunday, and we went in the afternoon with me and some of the other church kids and we got in trouble for watching the Care Bears. That's a man-made rule. I mean, the Care Bears aren't necessarily mentioned in the Bible, but 
Neither is, you know, there's the Sabbath day to keep holy. What does that mean? And, and you know, there's the, Jesus says about his disciples, you know, Sabbath wasn't made to control man, but it was meant to free us. And so you, you judge religion, you judge the rules of man by the fruit they bear, right? You look at it, is this creating life or is this creating death? And then you use your noggin. Hey, let's keep going. So becoming part of the kingdom of God, Raven's got no choice, he's going to grow. You're going to grow too. What does this look like? What does this maturity look like? Oh, I think one of the first things that we see is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. This is the Beatitudes. This is one of Jesus' most popular sermons. I mean, if this was on iTunes, this would be his most sold out sermon. People would have heard this a lot and they still have and it's preaching all the time. But he says this, blessed, nice King Jamesy, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ooh, so there's something that happens in this blesses the poor in spirit. Now, I've had lots of money at different times. Well, not compared to a lot of people, but I've had enough money to buy a Big Mac meal, and I've had times when I'm driving thinking, can I get a cheeseburger? You know what I mean? You, you ever have that scary feeling as a, as a university student, and, you, and you're wondering, I hope I have enough on this debit card to get a Big Mac? And that feeling of like, it's like, I really don't believe in gambling. It's like an extra tax, but you know, it's like that, woo, let's see, and I win. <laughs> I'm married now, so my wife handles the finances. I'm much better off. But it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is what the, the, the beginning steps of, of maturity and growing looks like. I mean, Raven's not going to come out running if he does, but uh, you know, Olympics are in his future, but probably just going to be, can't even lift his own head up first, right? He's got to learn to get his muscles up, right? Eventually, though, he will be chasing him here in youth group. But Billy Graham was asked once, what did Jesus mean by this? Are we supposed to be impoverished? You know, because some people will teach you that you should have no money, and if you have any things, oh my goodness, you're, you're worshiping things and stuff, and, but I I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's the case. And, and I like what Billy Graham said. He said, turn my page. We must be humble in our spirits. He said, if you put the word humble in place of the word poor, you will understand what he meant. I think humility is such an important part of maturity in Christ. You know, when someone has a complaint, to, to listen to what they're actually saying and, and to put your own defenses down and say, okay, is there a nugget of truth in this? Even if you disagree, to, to, to receive it, to let the person know you've heard what they're saying, that's maturity. It's so easy to put your defenses up and say, nope. But to stop and listen. Because you know what happens when people don't think you can hear them? You know what happens? They get louder, that's right. They think it's going to help. It's like we had uh, someone at Soul Food uh, on Christmas Day, actually. We had a, uh, a guy that was interpreting, and uh, I won't say names in case they're watching, but it was kind of funny because uh, he was trying to interpret, so he'd say the same thing. Tell them about your automobile, right? No hand signals, and so the other guy was like, hmm. So the interpreter was like, tell them about your automobile. And then he came up with a third strategy, which was, Tell them about your automobile. Yeah. None of that helped. And then Holly looked, automobile. Oh, yeah, I've got a BMW. And that was kind of funny. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Interpreter, if you see this. We actually love you very much. Isaiah 66 2 says this. Has not my hand, this is God speaking, has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one I will esteem. Oh, this is who God esteems. So this is important. This is one of those clues like, God, what do you require? I remember the first time I read that book, uh, Malachi, and it said, Lord, what do you require? I was like, oh, that's, you know, if you're going to have a conversation with God, that's a really good place to start. Because if, if he's actually God, an ultimate being, he's got some rights to require some things. What do you require? But here it says, um, what will God esteem? What does God like? You know, I, I want to please God with my life. And so he says, this is the one I will esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit. Not contrary, but humble in spirit, basically. Gentle in spirit. Who trembles at my word. 
And I don't know, sometimes when you read scripture, it can pierce your heart. And you've got a choice of what to do with it. You can say, yeah, no, I don't think I want to listen to that. Or, but if you allow it to pierce your heart, my goodness, it can guide your life into abundant life. James 2, 5 says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen, oh, God's chosen some people, who? Chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom. Whew. You know, when I talk to missionaries, they oftentimes, and even uh, Zahib won't mind me saying this, you know, when he, when he came from uh, his, his land of persecution and came here, you know, their churches were packed full. And he came here and he was like, where is everybody? I mean, we're free here. Why aren't people taking advantage of the ability to worship? To, uh, it blew his mind. Sometimes we get distracted by our own stuff. Um, I do, but I need to have my conscience aware and open to God to hear so I can, I can grow. Uh, there's an article by Colin Smith, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, what does that mean? This statement is full of meaning and yet is subject to misunderstanding. We only have to redefine our notions of the word blessed but also have to understand the enigmatic phrase poor in spirit. We've taken that apart. It means humility. It's recognizing your complete dependence upon God. I mean, if one of us, any of us, loses our health, I mean, you think about the financial state you can be in, just like that. We are dependent on God for everything, our breath. It's amazing, it's a gift. I love that YouTube video where, where the guy wakes up and, and everything's covered in presents, right? He, he unwraps his wife. He's like, I have a wife. And he, and he unwraps the light bulb, like the light switch. I have a light. And, you know, even the, the coffee percolator is wrapped up. And he's just, all the simple things he's so suddenly thankful for that he has these things. And it's that attitude of realizing, this is a gift I've been given. This is a gift I've been given. I mean, your goatee, Daryl, that's a gift, you know. To be poor in spirit is the first mark of a person who walks with God. It goes against the grain of our self-affirming uh, culture in so many ways. It seems sometimes that everybody's trying to say, oh, look how great I am. I'm the greatest of all time, you know. But apart from a miracle of God, you know, my next breath, it's a gift. And I thank God for it. Every time. Revelations 3.17, essentially the church of Laodicea, we're saying that we're rich. And so Jesus is, is confronting them. He's, he's, he's going to them and he's being contentious in, in, a, in a helpful way. Not contentious to put anybody down, but contentious to say, whoa, whoa, dude, that is like infectious. You probably need to see a doctor. He says, you say I am rich. I have grown wealthy and need nothing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I think if God told me that, I'd be pausing for thought. And once in a while, it's good to ask ourselves, okay, is there any way in my life that I am not up to snuff with God? Is there, is there places where I think I'm rich, where I'm depending upon myself? I can remember praying to God not too long ago, maybe a year ago or so, and saying, Lord, I hate to bother you. I hate to ask you for something. And it's, I kind of felt him come back to me and say, well, that's kind of what I'm here for. <laughs> I don't want to, I want to just want to do it myself. I don't want to bother you. You're the, you know, King, you've got other things on your mind. And it's like, no, I've got you on my mind. I've got you on my mind. And so Proverbs 3, 5 puts us in, in, in opposition to this thinking that I'm rich, I'm self-contained, I can do what I want, I, I, can, I can take care of myself, I'm, I'm wealthy by my own means. You just surrender that attitude and go to Proverbs 3, 5 and, and change your attitude and say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. It's so easy to, to feel like I can handle this, I can do this. And, and I think God has naturally gifted some people, but even to surrender those gifts and say, Lord, I thank you for the gifts you've given me. Now amplify them. Lord, let your power flow through me. Let your gifts flow through me, and Lord, change people's lives through my life. You know, as we meditate on how awesome God is, it's humbling. Like, 
I look at the snowflakes out there and I think about what you were saying. I'm like, every one of those is unique. Like, have they been unique for all of history? Do you know how many centimeters of snow fell in Newfoundland? <laughs> like, is there an angel up in heaven who's tasked not only with counting how many hairs are on her head, but how many different snowflakes there are? Like, what did they do wrong to get that job? <laughs> right? Categorize. I want you to draw each of these and time. Oh. There you go. They're humble because they're doing it for God. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Stephen was just saying Micah 6 8. So Matthew 5, 4, and 6. I want you to, I'm going to just going to bring you down to this Beatitudes real quick. And I want to show you there's a little bit of a difference between the other blesseds and the first blessed. Because blessed are the poor is the first one. So Matthew 5, 4, 6 says this. Blessed are those who mourn so they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for, ra- for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. But listen to the promise in Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's a tense difference. I don't mean camping tense. I mean there is a, a present tense in the verb for those who are humble right now. The kingdom of God is yours right now. The other promises come after a time. Those who are meek, though he slays me. You know, there's been a lot of people who've laid their lives down for their faith. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We all know that's a process. Blessed are those who mourn. You know, that's a process as well. And God will see you through those things. And there is a promise to inherit. But with humility comes the kingdom of God. That's what it looks like. We grow into it. Jesus was talking about a taste of heaven you can enjoy right now. It's more than just spiritual discipline. It's more than just a Christian character. It's part of becoming like Jesus, which is what we ultimately want to have happen. We want to be like him. He was God's redemptive servant. He was God himself. It's part of the mystery of the Trinity of God, the triune God, but In my opinion, God should be a bit of a mystery. If we could figure him out, I'd be a little disappointed, to be honest. He's an ultimate being beyond time and space. And we've got the English, French, maybe Italian. I'm not sure if you speak Italian too much. A little bit. Botticelli, Andrea, Botticelli, lasagna. Yeah, It's not going to help us much in describing God. But we've got limited language skills to describe an ultimate being. And yet... He still wants to know us. It's like a parent. Like, you know, I could, I've got 12 years of post-secondary education. And, you know, when, when, if, when Raven comes out as a little baby, I can talk. God, blah, 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 and he'll just look at me. All he'll know is that I love him. Not near as much as Joey and Don star. That he may not even be able to speak English or, or Ojibwe or anything. But he will know love. Right? And even like I think of my wife, and I think I've said this many times, I, I don't even understand my wife 100%, but I love her. I don't understand why she loves me, but I'll take it. <laughs> and the same with God. I don't understand everything. I mean, there's so much to understand. We have eternity to understand God and to share God and get to know him. And I'm excited for that. That is going to be awesome. In an upcoming series called A Peek at the Pastor's Faith, I'm going to let you in on some of my thoughts about heaven, some of the cool things to be expecting and looking forward to, because I think, I think there's, sometimes we, we kind of limit our brains to North American thinking, and we, and, we, and, we, and we just don't think outside the box enough, and there's some clues and some hints about heaven and earth, new heavens, new earth, oh, there's some cool things, so I'm just going to let you in on some of that in yeah, about a month, so you have to put up some other things first, but there's some cool things coming. Anyhow, getting back to being poor in spirit saying to myself, I can 
not do it on my own. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Lord, in this kingdom, I want to grow. I can't control how I'm going to grow. I don't know how tall Caleb's going to get. I'm assuming, again, I'll look up to him someday. But you don't know. But I trust my life to him that he'll craft me and he'll put me together and he'll put me through trials to, to, to chisel away and make me more like him to be his redemptive agent on earth as well. And as I study his word, I'll know what it means to love, what it means to be humble. And I'll look for people who act that way and I'll learn from them. Jesus said in John six thirty eight, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And that is the kingdom attitude. That is our attitude of maturity that we are to grow in. And today my challenge for you is just to, to seek God and say, Lord, help me to be humble. I know there's a country song, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. But it's not when we put ourselves in light of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll ask the worship team to come up and I'll just have a little word of prayer with us. And uh, we're going to sing one of our kingdom songs. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your kingdom is being built in us even now. And Lord, I pray that there would be so much life in us that when people see us, they're like, wow, I want some of that. What is that? And Lord, I pray that we will really understand you, that we will know you more, that you will deepen our revelation of you. Lord, deepen our revelation of being poor in spirit so we can be part of your kingdom now. Lord, we know, we've seen people who don't, are not humble, who are... Uh, cranky and angry and, and Lord we just we look at that and say we know that's not the kingdom of God so Lord help us not to be like that help us to be humble help us to be uh, chiseled and carved away through trials by your hand to become more like you so that we can become your agents of reconciliation so that, Lord those who don't know the greatness and the amazingness of you Lord Jesus Christ will find it in our lives they will see it in our lives God, I'm asking that you will shine through our lives and make us more like you. I thank you, God, for your persistent love. We pray this in your name. Amen.